as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Another exclusive guest, we got former officer and behind the blue curtain host, Stan Mason, on the show tonight, ladies and gents. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you, brother? I cannot complain. I cannot complain, but I can complain about the ill will of the world. <laughs> oh, we all can, absolutely. So, uh, well, what inspired you to come up with your electrifying true crime podcast? You know, well, uh, I guess first, so that the listeners have an idea of just exactly who is this guy. Uh, I was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. My mother was originally from Waco, Texas. In 1972, at the age of 10 years old, I went to Waco, Texas to visit my mom's family. And of course, like any kid from the North, I'm going to Texas. Everybody's got a horse and a gun and, and all that. And I got there quickly, found out that wasn't true. Uh, but I had a, when we were leaving, we spent a month there. When we were leaving, I had an extremely positive encounter with two Waco police officers who uh, came to the Greyhound bus station we were leaving from. And I was amazed to see, you know, they had the bullets all around their, their gun belt. And, 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 you know, they actually took time and talked to me. And the whole bus was actually waiting on me. And I'm out there. They let me touch the bullets that went around their gun belt. And. And they talked to me, and so I, I got on the, the bus, and I told my mom, I'm going to be a Waco police officer. I'm going to be a Waco police officer. And of course, like most mothers, oh, that's nice, you know. And uh, I graduated high school in 1980 and went into the United States Air Force, where I spent 11 years. I am a Desert Storm veteran, and I returned to Yokota Air Base, Japan, which is where I went to Desert Storm from. Oh, and, wow. Uh, they said, we have too many people. The Air Force was skimming down, and we have too many people in your job, and we'll pay you. At that time, they said $30,000 to get out voluntarily. Of course, you know, I mean, that's a lot of money, especially by that time I had my daughter, and so you, you're trying to get out and figure out what you're going to do. And the job All market these various works. concepts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I told my wife, I said, um, I don't know, should I take it? Should I do the career thing? And then they came a week later and said, they sent another letter, two weeks later, actually, if you choose to pass up this opportunity, we can actually do a record search or whatever through all the people of my rank in that career. And if we select you to get out, then we're only going to pay you $15,000. Now, I'm not an economist, but I know the difference between 30000 and 15000 so I told him we got out, we moved to Waco, Texas, and uh, we arrived there. We moved to 1911 North 6th Street in 1992, which was straight in the middle of Crack Central for Waco, which we didn't know because it didn't look like a, a drug area. And, um, you know, we got there and we set up and we're I'm fixing up this little house. And, and I was working a job as a security guard while I, I supplemented that. And I drove, I worked the alternative school downtown where I really loved the kids and bonded with them three days a week. But two days a week, I drove from Waco, Texas to a Motel 6 on Oakland Avenue in Fort Worth. 
and walked around that Motel 6 for 12 hours oh, and drove home. But that's what you do to, you know, take care of your family. And so I, I went down and put in for Waco PD. I was told there's a hiring freeze. We're not hiring. And I said, okay. And I filled out the little information card. About a month later, I got notified they were hiring. Um, I went down and, um, you know, filled out the little preliminary application, everything, put my resume with it. Uh, the day came for the civil service examination and mm -hmm. where the Baylor Bears, I'll talk about the ladies, champions, Baylor Bears, the guys too, but I'm not a big Baylor fan, but their basketball team is excellent. You know, the Ferrell <laughs> Center where they play is where they had the testing. And there were over 700 people in line for, I believe it was 26 or 27 slots. So I had just worked in Fort Worth that night. So I get there at seven in the morning. I'm tired. You know, I drove all the way back and I'm looking at all these people in line, you know, suits and ties. Some people were in smaller departments looking to move up. There's people in uniform and, and I got intimidated and I said, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're not going to hire me. Look at all these people here that are better than me. And I got in my car and actually left. And I drove, if anybody's ever been to Waco, I drove to right where the suspension bridge is and the convention center, straight down the street from the Ferrell Center, about two miles. And um, this voice that I call God said in my head, I brought you this far and you're going to quit now. So I turned around, I went back, I stood in line 30, 40 minutes, finally get in, we sit at the whole basketball floor is full of tables. I sit down to take the test, and it's the little fill-in-the-dot civil service test. It has a little tab on it. And when they said start, I remember, you know, you take your pencil and you break the tab. In my head, each of those tabs sounded like thunder, like gunshots. It was so loud in my head because I was tired. And I said, God, you know, I need you to take this test for me. I, I can't do this. And I started it. And I probably took 40, they gave us, I think it's two hours or three hours. I can't remember what it was. But uh, 45 minutes later, I, I was walking up to hand in my test. And um, people were looking at me going up there thinking, you know, he probably filled in anything. So I left, went outside. About two hours later, they called everybody back inside when the time ran out. And they said, we're going to read off uh, the first 100, the highest scoring 100 people. No particular order. Everybody else who passed. You know, if we don't call your name, you didn't pass, or we'll post the scores in the back. If you didn't pass, you know, we're not going to call you. If you did, and you're not in the 100, if we need you, we'll call you. So I was like listening for my name, and I was like number 38 or 39 that they called. And I was like, wow, I'm just proud to be in that number, you know. <laughs> and so they're, all, they're taking us, they were going to take us down to do the physical agility test, and then to go move forward from there. And, um, so when everybody else leaves the room, there's the hundred of us sitting in there and they said, okay, we're going to call everybody out now in order of how you scored on the test from highest to lowest, because that whole process is constant scoring. I was the first name they called, scored the highest of everyone. You know, so I, I felt good about that. I go to the obstacle course or the agility course. I set the record in that. And this is after working 12 hours in Fort Worth. So this wasn't me. To me, this was God. And um, so I, I'm, I know, I'm knowing I'm in the right place. I come, go to the academy, graduate. I come out on the street and I work in the hood where I live. I was fortunate enough and what people would call the hood. To me, I mean, these people, yes, there were people there that were prostitutes. There were people that were drug problems. There were people there that sold drugs. But I mean, these weren't, criminals to me, they were my neighbors. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to go to work and do my job. But if I was sitting on my front porch drinking a beer and the, the neighborhood crack addict came down the street, I'd call him over, hey man, what are you doing? And they all knew me. They knew who I was and they knew where I worked. And I didn't know it, but this community was embracing me because I'm them. I wasn't the cop that lived there. I was Stan who was the cop. You know, and at the end of my first year, I was actually selected as the first minority rookie of the year in the history of Waco Police Department. Then the next year, I was voted as 
Officer of the Year for the county, countywide. This was voted by citizens. And I didn't work for the county. I worked for the city. But the citizens countywide thought that much of me. And the first minority to get that. So that, that meant a lot. But anyway, I'm going through stellar career. Everything's fly, man, it's flying great. I am the poster boy for the police department, man. Everybody, all officers love me. Boy, that's Stan Mason. That guy is great. And then 2016 happened. And we had the deaths of Alton Sterling and Philando Castillo right on the border of each other. And I, I came home from a midnight shift. I was working. I worked midnights my whole career, except for a small stint when I was in uh, community policing. And I came home and I turned on the TV. And I think um, Philando Castillo's murder was first and followed by Alton Sterling. And I remember turning on. I'm like, God, not again. Because, you know, for me, because of the neighborhood I lived in, I didn't get to come home because I had a uniform and a badge. Right. I wasn't sold out to where it's the blue and my car and the backup and all, and all that stuff is great. I'm not knocking that. But I lived in a violent neighborhood. And I came home because those people let me come home. Right. And so... I, I became internally frustrated by not seeing, I didn't care if they were black, blue, green, purple, no officers were speaking up about this issue. So I did a Facebook Live video where I talked about it. I didn't talk about my department. It wasn't about my department or my city. It was about the profession because while I may have been okay in Waco, it doesn't mean I was okay 20 miles outside of Waco or in Dallas or Houston or Fort Worth. So safety was not dependent upon my geographic location at the time Facebook put my video up. It's about me as a person being able to freely travel in this country. It wasn't well received by people in the department. Uh, at, at that point, I became the worst. I was, you don't get any worse than my situation was at that point. I was a traitor. Uh, policing is a very blue family oriented as far as the bond part of family. It's not so much the moral part of family because we could talk about that later if you want, but sure. so, and, and, you know, I left uh, at my 25 year mark. I didn't want to, I mean, I'm in good shape now. In fact, my wife and I, an hour and a half from now will be in the gym. You know, we go to the gym four nights a week and still work out. And I just recently turned 60 last month, holding it down. Oh, wow. But, Congrats. Yeah, thanks. But, you know, I mean, I, I looked at problems when I looked at the policing community. And the community does not understand us. But it's not because they don't want to. It's because we don't let them. They go to all the meetings we organize. They arrange for babysitters. They take buses. They take trains. They take Ubers. They catch a ride. They walk, the church runs out the church. So the community's doing their part. We're not doing ours. And I don't mean the men and women that you see on the street. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about your chiefs, your city council people, your city managers, people who truly control how your community is policed. It's not that man or woman on the street you see every night. They, nine times out of 10, they don't like what's going on either. They just don't have a venue to speak. And I went into a long tirade about that, but, you know, that, that's how I got here. It does seem like no one wants to admit systematic wrongs, just like, you know, there's many supremacists who want to erase any of their wrongdoing throughout the history of mankind, just like anytime there's any progressive chat it instantly just there's always a troll that will come into a conversation and just act like oh you guys are mouthing off again you know and just totally diffuse the whole point of what it was actually all about and it seems like like you say this is just an a huge issue of like how this a neighborhood was formed how it could get better how it could improve does it need as much attention as some of them other not as fortunate neighborhood it, it seems like these are all just not only is everyone uncomfortable talking about it everyone just does not want to address it you know you, what you said brother that that's profound 
what you just said, and I'm going to tell you just you, you what you just said is light years away from where policing's concept of policing is today. Because you said something when you were talking about the neighborhoods, just in that little quick phrase you put out that's very deep. Let's let's first understand whether people want to call them ghettos, disenfranchised neighborhoods, low income housing, uh, economic development areas, whatever cliche we want to put on it. Let's first recognize this. And I think we are pro or anti, whatever fence people want to go on. I think we can all agree that no engineers and architects and investors ever got together and said, let's build a ghetto. They didn't build it. So then we have to say, well, how did it get that way? Sure, there are some bad people that came in there and helped it go along. Absolutely. Right. But I have to go back and we, we, we have to look at green lining. We have to look at, at racial disparity, economic disparity. So when certain people, well, we can look at Levittown in Pennsylvania as an example. When certain people moved in a neighborhood, the property value dropped just because they moved in. Never mind, they may have made more than anybody in the neighborhood, but they weren't the right color. Mm -hmm. So when, when those who feel empowered or privileged begin to move out, the cities will withdraw their economic support for that area. So when you don't have the city backing it, for instance, simple things, sidewalks. You go to sell your house, the sidewalk counts on the property value of your house. Streetlights count towards that. So when you remove that from that neighborhood, you're allowing that neighborhood to decay. In the late um, 70s to 80s, when we talk relevant to crime, we had what was called white flight. All of the wealthy, privileged white people ran to the suburbs. Couldn't wait to get out. That inner city is crazy, and those people, and they ran away. Not just from black people, they ran away from anything that was different and threatened their opinion of the neighborhood. So, okay, they get out there. They did about 10, 15 years out there. Everything was great. Then along came this thing called the internet. Mm -hmm. And right behind this came this other thing called the Wi-Fi. Guess what? We can't get internet out here in the suburbs. <laughs> yeah. We can't get Wi-Fi. Now, bear in mind, I don't care if we're talking Cleveland. We could be talking Chicago. We could talk about Dallas, Fort Worth. We could talk about uh, San Antonio, Houston, Austin, Miami. It doesn't matter. When, when, when these people abandoned these areas, they were typically areas that were along the river. Yep. And all your listeners, think of that in your neighborhood. Those abandoned, raggedy areas were along the river. That's where your poor people settled. So somebody came in and said, hey, let's take this warehouse, and I got a great idea. Let's level it out and put these studio apartments and put a, a bistro underneath and put a bar over here, and we'll attract people back to the city. We, we, can't, we can't do that because people live there. Oh, that's easy. We'll just gentrify them right on out of here. And I call it today antebellum reconstruction. It's not even a matter of gentrification. We'll just kick them out and we'll use this other concept, gee, eminent domain. How about that? Let's use that. So you push all these poor people and low-income people out from the area you abandoned so you can now come back and live with a bistro underneath you. That's essentially it. And as a security guard, I've done many of guarding a secure uh, construction site. And it's filled with people who are taken off early, you know, not working the so-called hours they're supposed to be working. Uh, but even more so, I, I see often, anytime there's like two to four companies splitting the bill, always, without hesitation, there are always one of them accusing the other of stealing their tools and they'll do the whole I've threatened to leave unless the other one gets kicked off. Because what I really want is I want the whole piece of the pie. I want the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's very messy. It, there just doesn't ever seem to be an organized way to do it. I know some people have had a successful career in construction. There's others who you know, have stories they can tell you all nonstop about saying, oh man, that was a pain. <laughs> just getting that done. Because morality and economic development are oxymoronic. They don't fit together. There's no morals in making money. People want to make money. If there were morals in making money, that would mean you would invest in the long term of feeding our hungry, feeding our homeless, who can then come back into the job pool and make you money. And that's where America has grown into this greedy environment. 
Yeah. And we love to give the term, I am the biggest advocate you're ever going to find for community policing because I did it for 25 years. I know it works. This is why you don't see it implemented in departments across the city. And I'm sure some of your listeners will go, well, that's BS. We got community policing here. And I challenge you and say, no, you don't. Community policing is a concept. It's a partnership between citizens and police that provides for a shared environment and solving community-related problems. That means one is not over the other. Community policing must be from the top to the bottom, from the chief to the janitor, to the men and women who are civilians taking reports, to the detectives working cases, to the SWAT team, to the men and women officers on the street. You just can't have the patrol officers doing it. Now, the problem becomes when you implement community policing, it, it, it magnifies the misunderstood definition of what policing is designed to do based upon what we see. Insert here at this point, you know, James Baldwin, who said, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Now, I say that to say this. When you hear these police chiefs stand up on a podium and talk about we're going to implement community policing, we're going to do this. No, you're not because your city council is not going to let you. Your special interest people aren't going to let you and your investors are not going to let you. Why? Because my job as the man and woman on the street, the average Joe officer, is to do what? Reduce crime, protect property. Exactly. If <laughs> I am reducing crime and protecting property, and if I'm doing it the right way, and if I'm building a relationship with you, and, and we're working together to do it, guess what we're not doing? We're not putting people in jail. Well, we just passed the bill for this for-profit prison, and now the prison is upset because we, we got a thousand-bed prison with only 300 people in it. And now because we're locked in a contract, because we guaranteed we keep the prison at 88 to 90 percent capacity for the next six years, and now we're down to 40 percent, and it's costing us twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a month to compensate the staff working there. To enter into a for-profit prison system is to be oxymoronic, is to combat the very principles of what policing is designed to do, according to Sir Robert Peel, the founding father of modern-day policing. This is all not rocket science. This is what we all see and know to be true. Well, and that's essentially it. It's like, uh, just like in every other industry, uh, crime fighting and personal business interests they, they all love to go the whole, let's take a shortcut, you know, just like, let's make tax deduction. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's figure out it later, which is their way of saying we we're in no interest of actually solving the problem. Mm -hmm. I, let's have the next guy, you know, elected or boss in charge, figure it out. And this is no different is like exactly it. And the profit for prison, you know, prison, I, I can't speak today. The, for proper prison. prisons, yeah. it just really is amazing how it's just very common. It's just second nature now. I can't think of any prison that isn't for that. It's like to them, it, it's just one way to trickle some money for the state and sure. get people encouraged to actually do it. And it's just like, but there's a, as a result, there is no guarantee that any prisoners, you know, not going to get bribed by a guard or going to actually get the proper you know resuscitation of by the way you got to go back into the world eventually and can't do what you you know are in prison here for but if there's just no correcting if there's just no it's just all fading and you know we're just going to encourage even more people to just break the rules because the people in charge who were supposed to be you know trusting are already breaking the rules so. sure but that and, and that's assuming that we have what we have come to call the rehabilitation system, which once again is no, another oxymoronic phrase. There's no rehabilitation taking place because the concept and practice of rehabilitation in reference to the criminal justice system in America is counterproductive to the economic goals of the means of policing. Now, that sounded real smart, a lot smarter than I am, but it's to say this. If I pull you over for running a stop sign and I give you a $300 ticket, Two in the morning, ain't nobody there but me and you. And you roll through the stop sign, it cost you $300. Where's the justice in that? Why can't that ticket be $30? It's not going to break you. You acknowledge that you did something wrong, we're good. So when we move from policing 
to prevent crime and deter crime, and we move more into the civil punitive phase. It really we're, is. We're, we're going to take your money from you. We're going to break you. You know, you got the kid, and I actually had this happen. I stopped the kid one night, and he was driving home. It was about 4 in the morning from his midnight shift at McDonald's. Ran a stop sign or something. I can't remember what it was. I wasn't busy. I mean, I'm just sitting there watching the intersection. And I go up, and this kid smelling like hamburger. He rolls the window down, and you always hear, I, I smell marijuana. I smelled hamburgers and french fries. You know, he's still in his McDonald's uniform. His uh, inspection on his tags was out. Oh, dear. Uh, his driver's license was expired. He goes through a stop sign. Now, to a lot of younger officers, oh, this is a three-banger. Oh, man, I get to hang this guy on everything. And I get all this stuff, and he's scared. And, and he had never met me. He had heard of me. And I go back to my car. And I'm sitting back there. And this is where I think it's severely lacking in policing is empathy. We have discretion. But discretion is no good if you can't couple it with empathy. Right. And I said, you know, just because I can't take this guy's next three months worth of checks, do I need to? Did he almost cause an accident? Did he do? So I went back up there. I said, hey, listen, dude, I got to write you for the driver's license. Just go get your driver's license tomorrow. You know, uh, come show them proof that you got your driver's license. And they'll make you pay a $25 administrative fee or whatever, and they'll throw the ticket out. Go get your registration done. Don't drive this car again until you get your registration. Yes, sir. I understand this and that. You know, now, people can say, well, you know, that's not your job. You know what? My job is to pre prevent crime. If I write this kid three, $400 worth of tickets, he goes home, tells his girlfriend, wife, baby, mama, whatever tag people want to put on it, well, here's the deal. I got $300 worth of tickets. If I pay these tickets, we got nowhere to live. We got no I, food this month. If I don't pay them, I go to jail and lose my job. Guess what? We got no place to live. We got no you food. You got to start all over again. <laughs> or if I go out and supplement it by selling weed, I can go to jail and guess what? We got no place to live. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I challenge any scholar or police chief to come Tell me the the benefit of nailing, not just nailing this kid to the cross, but sticking him in the side with the spear too. And, and then going home and going, I did my job. Yeah. 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 <sighs> I kind of go that, that ways back with even just legal aids. If it all comes down to, by the way, it's all what you introduce in court versus, you know, the privilege and how they're always trying to modify what privilege or confidence actually is. Eventually it all just comes down to who has the more amount of money and time. And it's like, no, it should be based on the facts. And so when we see stuff like in more recent years, like Zimmerman and Rittenhouse and everyone is trying to just flat out, you know, act like what only was seen in court was the full story. It's like, no, 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 no. You got to go on all the facts. That man in, in Rittenhouse case went to a rally to stir up some trouble. Mm -hmm. Had no business being there, and no one wants to talk about it. And I'm now seeing a bunch of white supremacist deniers doing the whole, oh, that whole flashy thing when he got out on bail isn't anything. I'm like, no, that. You no, know, <laughs> you know, brother, with with the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, I'm not surprised he got off. First off, the defense attorneys were piss poor. And did not present a strong case. The judge was unprofessional and known for Right. Well, Kyle did all but sit in the judge's lap and call him daddy. You know, I yeah. mean, to me, in that case, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, first off, and I have to view it through the lens God gave me. And sometimes people get upset when you order viewing it from a black perspective. Well, gee, I'm black. What do you want me to view it from? And I'm basing <laughs> my perspective on my life experience, which, by the way, right. they can bring up somebody with blonde hair, blue eyes, with a PhD that is not equipped to challenge my life experience. Life experience are facts we all live. They're not open to interpretation. They're open to discussion. That being said, Kyle Rittenhouse, first off, and his band of, of merry men, when they mm -hmm. arrived there at that rally, they were, they were at a police checkpoint. There was a right. curfew in place. That curfew extended to civilians. That meant Kyle Rittenhouse and his band of merry men, as well as the protesters. 
everybody should have obeyed that curfew equally, both sides. They were definitely enabled, yeah. But the cops gave Kyle Rittenhouse and his crew water and said, we're glad you're here, dudes. You didn't do that to the protesters. So now what have you, in absentia, what have you done? You've deputized these people, which is why they had the arrogance that they displayed. Now, Kyle Rittenhouse, I can tell you, Stan, as a black man in America at this time, and I, there's no way in the world I would have been allowed to walk up that street with AR-15 across my chest, past cops in armored vehicles. It would never have happened. Never. Totally. It, and everyone, again, they want to keep denying that, no, there's no bias. Like, no, I see you. I, 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 I see people at simple Walmarts, you know, just acting mm -hmm. different. If they see a minority, you know, coming up next, they're just afraid they'll get shouted at or get mugged. And this is like, well, you are having this very damaging, you know, just 40 years ago attitude. And you got to, you got to let go of this anger and this bullshit that is just in your head. And it's never been gone. And, and America doesn't want it gone. They and don't then, want you know, it gone. You, they don't want to fix any problem whatsoever. You alluded to it earlier. And, you know, when is the last time you tell me when America has ever been concerned? You were talking about the criminal justice system, the courtroom and facts. When has America ever been concerned about facts? <laughs> I don't think ever, no. Never. It's about privilege, power, and preference. The three Ps. It is the first never story that will sell in the tabloids, you know? That's and right. Uh, journalism is even more frustrating because, you know, my mother worked at the Star-Telegram and she had a real... She'd already tried teaching. Mm -hmm. She was at a really crappy school. You might've heard of Nimitz. It was mm -hmm. just one of those. They were like, oh, by the way, you gotta pass everyone. It doesn't matter if they don't do anything. It's just like, so how do I even teach if I literally have to pass them for doing nothing? You know, it's just- We and, don't need you to teach. Let the system catch them later. Just let it go by. And same thing with Star Telegram. They were just like, eh, how would you just edit this, you know, relevance and all that just cut to the details i'm like well and it's kind of like a stand-up comedian if they were to take out all the build-up and then it's like i just want the punchline and we'll decide if it's funny or not I'm like you know you you also earlier said something else profound you talked about the uh criminal justice system in the courts you know and i certainly am not speaking for every judge or every court system because i haven't viewed all of them and certainly haven't been to all of them but i'm going to tell you you know, I look at our system and I hear people say, it's the greatest system in the world. It's the greatest system in the yeah. world. Okay, well, then well. let me ask you this. <laughs> our court system is not built upon what you did or did not do. And people go, well, you're a cop. How could you, you used to be a cop. How can you say that? The court system is not built. Your conviction is not dependent upon what you did or did not do. Now, that's going to sound like a bold statement. But I will, I, I will submit this. Your guilt or innocence is based upon how you say what you did or did not do. Now, that is dependent on two factors. Some people, well, three factors. Who gets to say what you did or didn't do? Your attorney. Some people, celebrities, privileged people, politicians, have scream it from the mountaintop money. That means everybody can hear them. Some people have moderate talking to you money. Totally. Maybe you get a fair shake. And then there's this other demographic of people who have whisper money. That means none at all. So you give them a public defender that already has 30, 40, or 50 cases. It's not because he or she doesn't care about that person's case. It's because they're so overwhelmed trying to juggle all these cases. And that's not a, a, a racist thing because I will say, and I won't mention names, but there are just as many black attorneys out there willing to take advantage of the system to make money and people's condition as there are white ones. Right. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, judges can be paid for and bought off. You don't believe me? You listen to any gang member, any mafia person that's been arrested, and listen to the people they brought down. Go look at Serpico. <laughs> yes, Serpico. There you go. We're going that far back. But yeah. I do like how ma many will just pretend, oh, judges, they were appointed. I'm like, again, 
and like you say, anyone can be abused, taken advantage of, or just given a fee. And I mean, I'll see people even critique some of the legal TV shows just because they're fiction. Everything is like, no, I have heard about that. And how there was a exceptions made to this or that is like, just because you're appointed or in a public office doesn't mean you're necessarily always doing the right thing. But yes, there, there is that prejudice and preconception by many in the public that, you know, oh, you were appointed. You're the holiest of the holy. You know, it's like, well, says who? <laughs> you know, and, I just and, have to say. And you're right. A lot of it comes from television. You know, I always tell people, I grew up, you know, I was born in the 60s. I grew up, I watched shows like Adam 12. <laughs> oh, there you go. But, but you saw de-escalation. You saw dialogue. You saw interaction. Yes, it's Hollywood. But the officers got out the cars and talked to people. They walked the beat. They did all these things. And then we had this thing, which in my personal opinion, did the most damage to the profession of policing is a show called Cops. Mm -hmm. When cops came on, you saw car chases, helicopter chases, dogs barking, SWAT teams, chasing people, throwing people around, handcuffing people, fighting. And a whole generation of young people grew up and said, I want to do that. But what they didn't know and to your listeners who never knew this, they're going to learn something tonight. There's a difference between cops and police officers. Most police officers don't like being called cops. They take offense to it, but they don't let the citizens know because we know the citizens don't know any better. But most police officers do not like being called a cop. I didn't like being called a cop. And the difference is when you see cops come on, all the action and drama, cops live for that. That's their whole day. Even when it's quiet and they say, let's go stir something up, it's too quiet. I'll create something to put somebody in jail just so I'm not bored. But the police officer can do everything the cop can do. All the dramatic stuff, the jumping through windows, the TJ Hooker flip over the car. The police officer, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he or she can do all of that. But they can do one thing that the cop can't do. They can stop everything they're doing and go down on a knee and tie a kid's shoe on the way to school. They know how to hit the brake, put that car in park, get out, and go sit on Miss Jackson's porch just for a minute. You're not on a call, and instead of driving around till you get one, they just get out and sit on the porch and go, Miss J, how you doing today? And she'll say, how you doing? I'm so tired today. I done had as much baby mama drama. Child, I know it's far. And what are you doing? You're visiting. The job doesn't have to be that hard. Right. Everybody is not your enemy. You and I talked earlier, and we talked about, you know, suicide versus the real threat to police. We make this harder than it needs to be. Totally. Uh, and, you know, it, it again, just so many factors, you know. Uh, guns, politics, community support, personal crisis, you know, and it, it's like everyone needs to be reminded to just take out a fact sheet, just like, and just say, I did this today, I did that today. And it, some people, they can't make it second nature to themselves, just like, you know, eat, drink, sleep, work out, you know, it just, it seems like it's just too much effort for some people. And it's just like, well, what, do you really want to make a difference? Or again, do you just want to kick someone's ass and have them pay a fee and, you know, act and, like you know, society will sort itself out? And, and you know, for me, the, the professional policing, I don't pretend that it's without sin because Lord knows I spend enough time on my shows going in, not to bash it, but to bring it to the forefront and we work our way through it. But I got to say this to the public, you know, if, you call me to your house, you got a bitch or a complaint about this officer. Right. And I ask you, what's that officer's name? I don't know. Okay, well, it's four in the afternoon. What's the officer that works your area during the daytime? I don't know. What about the officer that's taking care of your property at night while you sleep? I don't know. What's the sergeant's name? I don't know. Commander? I don't know. What's the chief's name? I don't know. What's your city council person's name? I don't know. Get out of here. I got no time for you. Because, see, this is the concept of community policing. Yes, the officer may or may not have done something wrong. Maybe your problem is burglaries. You're telling Stan, it is not Stan's problem. I will not and cannot carry your cross. 
Policing did that for years. That's one of the reasons why we're where we are. Because for years, in the 80s and 90s, our solution was to you, I'll take care of it. And we quickly found out that after a shift of telling 20 people you'll take care of it, you haven't taken care of nothing because you can't handle all of it. You probably can't solve a tenth of it. But that community is glad to give you the problem since you said, I'll carry that cross. They're willing to let you. And you know what? When you don't take care of it, they're going to be quick to remind you. You told me you take care of it. Yeah. And what community policing says boldly, is that okay? I'm coming into your neighborhood. You got prostitutes, you got drug dealers. That's your problem. Hey, mine, I don't live here. It's yours. I will be here. I have a whole geographic area. I am willing to spend as much time with you on your block to fix your problems, the neighborhood's problems, as you're willing to back me in fixing it. When you show me you don't care anymore, I'm going to the next neighborhood that does care. Now, that's hard talk, but that's the way it has to be. You have to first say as a neighborhood, yes, cops are supposed to fight crime. Yes, cops are supposed to prevent crime. But as a homeowner or a neighbor or a human being, you have a moral obligation yourself to be involved in your problem. And America yeah. lives in a blue welfare state. I don't care if it's the rich people in the mansions because they're worse than the people in the projects. Well, I pay enough in taxes. I don't see why you all don't take care. My trash wasn't empty. Well, they're not supposed to come up to your front door and get your trash can. Put it on the curb like everybody else. Next question. You can't tell me that. I own a business downtown. Bullshit. Yeah. I'll call I, the chief. You know, that kind of stuff. I see a bunch of it. And they, they just, somewhere along the way, everyone just figured, hey, you know, my tax return does all the talking, yada, yada. I don't have to learn actual communication skills. It's like, no, just like any protest, riot, you know, it's the equivalent of booking a restaurant. You, you got to go down there to the station, probably spend a good chunk of your day and fill out a report, you know, give the more details, the better, you know, and patience is a must for anything, you know, but. It, and know your rights. Know your know rights. Your rights. Good God, if you don't get to, but five. Learn five this month and five next month. You know, I, I watch the auditors that are on. And this is the biggest frustration I have with the profession. Stop demanding ID because these men and women are in a, not in a stop and ID state. First off, find out if you're in a stop and ID state. They're on public property where they can legally film anything they can see because your eyes cannot be trespassed. Mm -hmm. And officers will come out and destroy their department's reputation and the city's reputation because of their ego. Give me your ID. Well, you suspect me of a crime? Yeah. No. Well, in Texas, 3802 says I have to be either in the act of committing, may commit, or have committed a crime. Well, because if a peace officer shows up, you got to give your ID. That's bullshit. It, it really is. And it's just, again, like you say, an intimidation tactic. And mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking about suicide rates, how uh, you want to uh, uh, build on that a bit. I, I got another side story that I heard on a true crime podcast. Sure. You know, I mean, w we look at videos and we always hear the officers say, and it's not to take anything away from officer safety, but we constantly hear, I'm in fear of my life. Step back. I call 20 people because I'm in fear of my life, even though it's daytime and the person's in a wheelchair. But we always hear that. I'm in fear of my life. Okay, we go to the range, and depending on your department, some departments are once a year, some may be every four months. And all those bullets we're shooting down range, you taxpayers are paying for. And you're paying us to be out there on the range shooting those bullets when we're not out on the street solving crime. I'm not against officers being proficient and handgun techniques. All of the other training we get, whether it's de-escalation, which to me either is being given and not implemented, or it's just not given at all. Cultural diversity, all these other, you guys pay for that. And so we get in the car and we go out and we hear, be prepared. That citizen can hurt you. Be on guard against the citizen. They're a threat to you. Man, please step back. You're making me uncomfortable. I'm in fear of my life. But for the last four years, the number one killer of police officers has not been citizens or traffic accidents. It's been suicide. I believe it. I remember the young church noted that 
<coughs> any case involving, you know, death of officers. Wasn't at rallies, wasn't at any mm -hmm. violent robbery. It was more often not by other cops. And it was often involving corruption or just, again, like you say, just someone went home and just one day said, I have nothing to live for. Sure, and, and, and the narrative that departments will typically run from an officer's suicide, they don't just smirch the officer, but they don't get the big funeral procession we see for the other officers. And that's because, you know, departments are culpable. Officers, I believe, and this is just my opinion, and during the few cases I've read and looked at, a lot of times it wasn't because the officer was dirty and under investigation. Does that happen? Yeah, it does. It wasn't because the officer's wife left him and went off with somebody else. Now, we come to work, we got the same problems in our house you all have in yours. We understand that. We got a grip on that. Mm -hmm. But we go to work, and we put up with internal bullshit and policies and special treatment. When policies come down to us in roll call, we're not going to do this in this neighborhood, but we do it over here. You don't think we're sitting in that room, and we don't know why you're doing it? None of us can say, no, I'm not going to do it. And it's easy for people to say, be a whistleblower. Really? Well, you citizens aren't exactly beating down the door for whistleblower protection. That's coming from me personally. I can I tell you, I don't have a bunch of citizens that have come to me advocating for me. We got your back, whistleblower protection. So that's why officers don't speak. But the, the bigger thing is you've got your special interest in your city, the rich folks, the privileged folks. They want things a certain way. You already know you can go to the, the, the bar at the poor end of town and park and wait on a drunk driver. I dare you to take your patrol car out there to the country club entrance and park there and wait on them drunk rich folks to come out. You won't do it again. Go down there to the college. If you've got a, a college, just a pre premier college, go down there. Start pulling them kids over who got the rich mommies and daddies. And when they call that department, watch how fast that case gets dropped. It's called in the interest of justice. So you got all that you're dealing with in roll call. Mm -hmm. Then you have, you know, we don't have quotas anymore. They found out that, you know, we can't call them quotas anymore. That's a bad word. We can get sued. So we'll call them performance evaluation standards. This wow. person wrote this many tickets. So, wow, they're a great officer. But you've been here this long. You haven't written that many tickets, which I actually had happened to me. Once in roll call, a little young rookie went out there writing a bunch of tickets. And they said, well, you've been here. You know, you only wrote X amount of tickets last month. I said, yeah, I only worked X amount of accidents. Well, what do you do out there all night? I said, well, while he was in jail because he pulled somebody over, they had a barking dog warrant or they had a stop sign warrant or they had this and he's writing a ticket and he's at the jail for an hour and a half to do that. I worked four burglar motor vehicles in his beat. Oh, by the way, I had the lowest burger and motor vehicle rate in my beat this month. Did you know nobody got murdered in my beat this month? But I worked three aggravated assaults in his. Oh, but that's officer of the year over there. You know, he's writing tickets. Do you really think the business owner who came to work and their $3,000 plate glass window is broken and $10,000 worth of property is gone? Do you think they care the next morning how many tickets that officer wrote? <laughs> yeah See, and uh, i i believe it because I, I have an idiot worker at my security job for instance and you know same difference even with the assistant managers they're all worried they look at everything at face value and sometimes we even got to get the main manager involved he takes it you know with a grain of salt and it's like you got to take it all with a grain of salt because yeah there's plenty of people who want to slack off and then just to meet the quota or requirement uh, or look like they're doing their job when they haven't been, you know, yeah, we'll just go on a giant just goose chase. And that's why I'm really not surprised at the time when someone looks at an arrest report and they're like, wait a minute, why was this officer here? This is outside their jurisdiction. Or why was this guy here when, you know, this just sounds personal as opposed to a legit concern or someone was actually doing something wrong. You know, it's, it's just messy, messy. And, well, because we don't want to problem solve. And ultimately, no. it's because America has, it, we, we are mathematically deprived. We, we are unable to grasp and understand the concept of equal. Equal does not mean 
I now have more than you. Equal mm -hmm. does not mean there's no minus. We didn't take anything from you to get to this person to make them equal. Equal cost you nothing. Yeah. We're not talking about money. We're talking about rights and dignity and humanity. And America has these, these benchmarks, these, these clubs they put people in. Mm -hmm. And God forbid you be there. And it ain't all about race. You could be the white guy with the long hair, but if, by God, if somebody in the club thinks you're a biker, you're a biker. Yeah. You're a tweaker. Everyone and, needs a label. Everyone must be, uh, you know, uh, just implemented into the society, whether by force or by pure exactly. pressure. Uh, how, how many families can you think who, you know, uh, man mandated that their kid go to a college and kind of just coax them into a profession? You're like, hey, be part of the family business, you know, be part of this profession because I've always wanted you to be. I, you know, I, I never asked you, my, my son, my daughter, for your opinion. And if you drop out of college, you're ungrateful and you, you know, you should rot by yourself. And it seems like there's just so much of that just coaxing everyone. There's well intention behind some of them. And then there's all these other factors. Like, it's like the you American said. way. Yeah, it's the American way. And you know, if, if you're so privileged and honored and the biggest problem in your community it's the damn kids on the skateboard. That's the big, I need three officers out here. This kid is on a skateboard. Yeah. And, and you got other how communities. how dare he be minding his business, being, doing what kids do. Yeah. Sure. In other communities, they're going, well, there's bloods and crips over here killing people. Can we get somebody here? It ain't the officer's fault. They can't go to that because they're tied up over here with something that has nothing to do with anything. That police should never, number one, I'll clear this up. If I was a chief somewhere, don't call me. I didn't, I'm not sure if I locked my door, Chief. Will y'all go check? No, it's not our house. It's yours. Private property. You go check. Kids are skateboarding down the street, and it's, that's a crime. I'd be the chief telling the city council, get rid of that ordinance. A thousand percent. And So there's things we're doing that, that occupy our time, not because the, the officers don't have the option to say no. You know, I used to get calls. This is an honest-to-God call. This is 2 in the morning. Blackmail, caller called in, blackmail walking down the street. And I had had it with those calls. So I'm waiting on a, a sergeant to surely they're listening. They're going to go, we're not going to that. No. And I wait. I said, well, is he doing something else? Is he hovering? Is he flying? Is he doing something? So I got to the call. And the guy, the kid knew me. And he said, uh, why did you stop me? I said, because you're black walking down the street. I said, that's what it says on my computer screen here. Come here, take a look. Not, not let him see it. I said, so when you're screaming at the officer, you're stopping me for being black walking down the street. He absolutely is. Not because he or she wants to. It's because the sergeant didn't have enough guts to say we're not going to that. And the chief doesn't have enough balls to tell that community in a public service announcement, we will no longer go to any calls where it's because they're black or they're white and they're simply taking part in a constitutionally protected activity and something that's not suspicious in nature because you don't feel right about it. It really is amazing. It's just, there's all these paranoid bigots and I, I get it plenty of times doing security work. Uh, I will, we would have people say, well, uh, and we would literally pressure them. It's like, so what exactly is this person doing? They're out on the porch looking at me smoking weed. It's just like, I, unless he's flashing himself or actually, you know, beating someone up, I, you know, who are you? Why, why do you care? You have too much free time. And there was a bunch of that when COVID first hit. Um, I, I even had plenty of times where sometimes 911 was very polite. Other times 911 was very rude. And it was just like, it was a matter of just, uh, uh, it, it even gets even more ridiculous to where the private property role where it's like, we really do need police to intervene at private property, but there's other times where it's like, yeah, no, unless you give me the code, I can't. You know, I, brother, I'm going to tell you, I, I really wish Texas, if you want to free up your officers to be able to do constructive things and have more interpersonal relationships with their citizens, you need to figure out y'all's marijuana policy there. Because I'm going to tell you, it's taking officers, officers don't like dealing with it. It takes too much time. 
whether I got an ounce or a gram, it's the same amount of time at the jail, same amount of paperwork. It eats us up. Officers don't like it. it it's destroying people's lives. And, you know, I, I can tell you, and maybe I was just lucky, I've never fought anybody high on weight. The most they were going to do is midnight shifts. We didn't get lunch hours, so you usually stop by a convenience store and grab something. I'm taking them to jail, and they hear the bag rattle. Mason, that smell like Doritos, man. You going to share them? All most they're going to do is eat your Doritos. They ain't gonna, I fought plenty of drunks. Yeah. But the, 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 the people high on weed, and, you know, and that's a, a, a state decision. You guys make it yourself. But, I mean, the constant villainization of marijuana, like that's the number one killer. You know, and no, it's not in Texas. Cartels gave it to us. Oh, we yeah. got outlawed. And even though Poor we don't know the different types of drugs. and yeah. Poor police management and, you know, the lack of uh, mental health for officers, the lack of suicide prevention for officers, those are, and, and the lack of, of whistleblower protection. Whistleblower is good. Yeah, because it seems like anytime anyone is legit doing the right thing, they, they get pressured by, oh, you're snitching. Oh, you're ungrateful. How much you want for us to pay you off? You know, mm -hmm. so well, tell me. You know, the George Floyd, Justice and, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, you know, I thought it was a good step. Where I run into issues with it is that I don't believe in a policy that co-signs this divide of us them. And yeah. I think the way that bill is written, it does that because I think people forget that police officers are part of a community, maybe not the specific community where they work, but they're part of a community somewhere. So if you really wanted to make that bill go bipartisan and pass by, here's two things that I thought should have been put in that bill. Number one, number one, whistleblower protection for all officers equal to that that fed, uh, the feds have. Reason why that's important. We can talk about the problems in policing all day long. But if officers don't feel safe to step up and testify to it, we're never going to get police reform, which is why we have it. Number two is mental health for officers. If I'm willing to take my life, do you think I give a damn about yours? So let's fix that problem. Then we move into the other things that come in. Now, what that does is you propose the bill, as I've just suggested here, it should have been done. And you're going to have police departments and unions go, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're actually giving us something in here. They actually right. see that we, the men and women on the street, I'm not talking about your administrators. I'm talking about your men and women on the street. We, you know, I think the communities forget that, yes, you live there. But guess what? I spend 40 hours a week there. And when I'm there, I'm dealing with the shit that keeps you in the house scared to look out the window. Mm -hmm. I got a stake in this. You're not alone. I'm here with you. We right. just have to trust each other. You don't have to trust my sergeant. You don't have to trust the chief. I never policed for my department. That's just where I worked. I didn't police for the city of Waco. That's just who I worked for. I policed for that person in front of me. I didn't care if you're a professional, a prostitute, a crack addict, homeless. You know, the, the God I serve raised me, and I kept this born. and I didn't let the police academy train it out of me. But God told me, as you do unto the least of my people, not the ones you like, not the ones who like your football team, who vote like you, who look like you, the least. Policing is not a profession. Mm -hmm. It is a ministry. Just because you're in it doesn't mean you're good at it. Right. And we got a lot of mega church, for lack of a better expression, cops out there. Everybody likes them, but they do nothing. That's yeah. why we can't solve cases. Well, and as I said, too, I mean, there's many who will use religion, social influence, especially social media, and e even religion, dare I say, uh, to abuse their privilege and so-called, you know, like you say, they, they want to be the poster boy. They don't want to necessarily actually make a difference. And like you say, it is very frustrating. And I think it, it just goes down to it's just everyone – who enforces something is just they always go about it the heavy-handed way they, they just think one way or the other that was the best way possible is what it came down to i'm like no 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 there are so many different ways to go about it anything and 
Uh, I mean, I think our problem is not, you know, you always hear in what you're saying, we always hear the term, we need more training. We need more training. Chiefs always love to throw that out of press conferences. I drop a bullshit flag on that because I say in, in many departments, taxpayers pay enough already for our training. We don't have a problem with attending, understanding, and comprehending the training. We fall short in the application process. We selectively choose when to apply that training. Now, when people say, well, that's not true, I say, well, then show me the officer that polices the low-income area the same way he does the, the gated community. I uh, totally you know what you can get away with over there and what you can't. You're right. And it, it, it goes down to just, again, just like with any business, there's always people who are like, well, we need you to be able to work all kinds of shifts, all positions. And always, there'll be always someone who does the whole, well, I can only do this. So maybe this isn't the job for you. And everyone likes to, again, make a shortcut or do something like that to where they're like, well, I'm only going to work this certain day. And, Everyone else has to work these kinds of days or yeah. this area well, with this set of skills and this knowledge, and I'm going to be Mr. Ninkumpoot or who. And, and you're always going to have those people in policing. We have them. Those are typically your people who come out of the academy. They work two or three years in patrol. They get a little inside job somewhere, shining somebody's desk, and then they get another job over here, maybe dumping the chief's trash. Then ten years later, they're over here doing something and next thing you know they're a commander oh wow see yes it happens you know i i know of a chief right now i got more time in a property room than he had on the street but he's moved beyond chief to an administrative position so just like with any job how you'll see someone who's your new boss and you're like once again less time than me and he's all he or she is like what did they say what did they do to impress someone to promote them you know <laughs> sure but it, it's about the officers because to me if officers that will hear this later and i don't care if you're a five-year officer 10 15 20 25 year officer listen to what i'm going to tell you and this is not anything bad on the profession if you're still chasing awards and recognitions and medals and the respect and the brotherhood and the family and blue family. If that's your goal and you think you're going to retire and all everybody in the police department is lighting up your phone, come over and have a beer. We're all going fishing. Clyde, you want to come deer hunting? That's bullshit. It's not going to happen. When you retire, your phone doesn't ring. Mine yeah. stopped ringing long before I retired. But you know what it does happen? That community, if you serve them truthfully, when your department has long forgotten about you and no longer talks about you, there's people on social media who will remember you. Man, you, you don't remember me probably, but man, I got two kids now, and man, you changed my life when I was in fifth grade. That is policing. Yeah, you're gonna get personal calls from people in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and it seems like, like you say, everyone just thinks, again, just like with any industry, it's just instant. It all happens overnight. Yes, sir. I think I'm even more frustrated by, like you say, how, uh, you know, it, it's just never ending cycle. It, and I just wonder why it just can't seem to work out at all. It seems like it's a mixture of everyone hates the defund the police logo. And it's like, well, however we say it, it's still it's supposed to have the same meaning in that, you know, police the police from time to time. And then we got other stuff like, uh, you know, people making mocking what Black Lives Matter even means. I see other people doing All Lives Matter. I'm like, well, that's not technically true. It's because then you're saying, you know, all criminals' lives matter. All you know, it's like sure. you know, we we. It, it seems like what what words do you think we can even say that will make sense to someone? You know, it you know seems when 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 people tell me. All lives matter. The two questions I ask them, are you pro-choice? <laughs> yeah. And then the other question I ask them is, do you support the death penalty? I don't stick around for a response. It's rhetorical. It's not meant to pat me on the back or make me sound smarter than I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's to give you something to think about when you say something like that. 
You know, I think until we get, if we don't do anything else but policing, we can no longer tell the public, give us a chance. They've done that. They've gone to all of our meetings. They've gone to all of our gatherings. They've supported us. They've done even people who had no reason to support the police. Let that officer go home. Uh, it's, I, I think yeah. that's just it. I, I think a lot of people, again, that they just want to quickly respond to something. To them, this is the equivalent of just responding to some football player they saw on TV. I got, I got to weigh in with my th two cents, but my th thoughts. But, but to the, to the protesters or the other side, I say this to them. Why don't you push through your city council instead of marching and protesting around an empty building where they gave the whole staff the day off because they knew y'all were going to be out there and you're wondering why nobody's inconvenienced because they're sitting home drinking Starbucks. No one's hearing it. Building. How about you do this? You go to your city council and tell them in this city, we want our city to a dock whistleblower protection for officers. When you get officers who can now testify openly to some of the stuff happening, that may not be as bad as somebody shooting somebody. It could be the rogue officer. If you don't think we as officers know who's rotten in our departments and who's not, you got another thing coming because we know everything. We don't have to be beer drinking buddies. We know who, who to stay away from because you don't agree with what they do. You may not know all the details, but you know who's screwing whose wife. Another problem in policing that's unaddressed, it happens everywhere, but it happens in policing. And why it's important in policing, if the guy on my right is sleeping with the guy on my left wife, I don't know, either. I'm not married to either one of them. I don't care, but guess what? Everybody in the room's got guns and we're going to go out there tonight and work a shooting because somebody slept with somebody else's baby mom. Yeah. So Chief, you're risking my life in roll call before I even hit the street. Oh God. It, so it, how about whistleblower protection? How about that one? And then let's throw in the A word accountability how about that gee let's just try it it's never been tried in america we've never had to be accountable for anything not just the police the city council the city, everybody's just asked to leave and they've retired nobody's ever accountable well we paid out four million no you didn't the taxpayers did get it right definitely seen a lot of that as well it seems like uh, to again uh, you know, and again, every, everyone seems to, again, just along the way, uh, just we, we either remark about you or we bash you. There mm -hmm. doesn't ever seem to be any just, here's how I got this and what I did with that. Because like you say, everyone somewhere along the way just decided, I don't want to know the details. I just have to believe you mm -hmm. or not believe you or just like what you say. Plausible deniability. I don't want to be responsible. Right. And, and if you want to clean up your police department, and, and I'll use this term and folks go, we don't have that here. Go talk to an officer that you know real good. And if they tell you, absolutely not, we don't have it, it's because they're part of the problem. It's called the good old boy system. Been alive and well in policing. At least 25 years I've been there. And if you're in a medium size or above department, it's there. Some folks get away with everything. Other folks get nailed to the cross. I bet. Talk to the officers about it. They'll tell you the officers. They'll tell you who they believe is in it. The good old boy system. And guess what? It ain't all white guys with big stomachs and flat top cuts. There's some black folks in it too. When you're in that in crowd, you got car blanche. You're one of us. Don't worry about it. We got you. But you're crucifying everybody else trying to do the right thing. The good old boy system. Don't ask the detectives about it. Ask that man or woman that's working the streets. Ask your chief this question. And this is something I, I sure hope people write some of this stuff down. Ask your chief the next city council meeting when he's telling you how great the police department is. Chief, what style of policing have you mandated that the department follow? Here are the types of policing. And you can't have half the people doing this. and have, Everybody's got to be, it's just like a ship. Everybody is on that ship. The captain sets the course, the ship sails in one direction. You have call driven. That's what, to a degree, Fort Worth does in Dallas, Austin, L.A., San Diego, New York, Chicago. Your huge cities where you come to work and you're never going to get to all these calls. You just get in the car and answer calls till you get off. You're never going to get caught up. 
you got reactive policing. That's where you handle the calls. And then as soon as you don't have any calls on the computer screen, I'm going to go look for something. I'm going to go look for a guy running a stop sign. You have uh, problem-oriented policing, oftentimes disguised as community policing. What problem-oriented policing is, if I come to your house and sit down with you in your living room and help you through your problem, whether it's setting you up with a budget or, you know, whatever the case may be, I walk you through your problem. You benefit from that. But the community does not. Your neighborhood does not. Then you have my favorite, community policing, where the benefits not only spread throughout the neighborhood, but they also they spread out to me and the department and the city. That's the only four types of policing. And if your chief doesn't know those four types or ask them, what are the four types of policing, chief? If your chief, who sets the direction for your department, cannot tell you the four types of policing, Maybe y'all hired the wrong person. Maybe now yeah. you understand why this officer cuts a break and these five hammer everybody to the wall. This guy's doing community policing the best he understands it. These people over here are doing reactive. Uh, I remember you doing a good job of highlighting those. It's like sometimes a simple meeting is all you need to know. And it's just like impressions, you know, treat it like you mm -hmm. would a job interview. It's like if you can already tell the person is just asleep at the wheel, just not there, mm -hmm. then all you need to know and like you say it's just uh see where uh uh your your voice can actually be heard instead of just getting angry that no one's listening or acting like oh i don't care anymore it's like no you do care let's let's find out someone who will listen i mean i used to do political campaigning for local candidates and it was a good introduction but i can't say it was always well run because they would want us to go to every kind of area, the numbers were outdated. And again, you're going to get a lot of angry people telling you to go screw yourself. And, and you know, and you know brother, I mean, it's like, and this is just fan. My philosophy, like with my show, I never, there's no GoFundMe for the show. There's no donation button. I don't come on and tell people like and subscribe and share. I don't. If you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. But, you know, I never base, there's nowhere you can even donate money to my show. I mean, I've always felt that whether I look at it and it's, you know, 5,000 viewers or 50, it's not to me how many people listen. It's who's listening. Yeah. I may change, stop somebody from committing suicide that day. I may never know it. I don't need to know it. It's not important. Somebody who has no reason to have hope may listen to something I say or a caller calls in and says that gives that person hope it's not important that i know or take credit or the show did this that's bullshit it's all semantics mm -hmm. the and, problems are bigger than me or you and just spouting it out is just as bad as being trivial about something it's just like mm -hmm. no let's let's do some actual research on it and go go a certain that's mile good. and like you say uh, i mean you you've talked before about how people would hate uh, when it hated when people were being arrested and they could tell that you understood what police code they had said. And I think this is it. A lot of people are insecure and they hate it when someone knows what they know or mm -hmm. what they don't know. It just mm -hmm. it infuriates them. And I, I've seen that in every job, every industry, every area. It's, it's and never so mind that they're our boss. You know, yeah. they are our boss. Right. How and dare you be informed? And it's just like, I'm just doing my job. And like you say, I mean, uh, I'm trading this new guy he, who's a security guard, and he's an idiot. He, he absolutely thinks he knows more than the average Joe, and he's only been working here for like five months. And it's just like, well, guess what, buddy? You know a lot, but you're acting like a super cop, and I'm just waiting to write you up if I hear just anything that is literally breaking the law, you know. You, you can get the fuck out of this security job and go join somewhere where someone will have you. <laughs> you know, if you're going to put on a badge and a gun, you don't get to be a convenient hero. Right. You don't and get the hero, to be dismissed and acting like, oh, he did it in the best interest. He broke right. one rule. He gets and if, away with it. And you're, you're, whether you're not you're a hero is not dependent upon your perception of yourself. 
Yeah. It's what does the community think of you? I'm not talking about the people who, you know, there are people who I could go to work and they could see me in uniform and they would come across the convenience store or across the road. Oh my God, I'm praying for you. Thank you for what you do. God bless you. Thank you. Blue lives matter, blah, 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 blah. But these are the same people that I could be in my cutoff shorts or gym shorts, t-shirt, holy jeans, whatever stop at the store and they're in there and they clutch their purse, lock the car doors when I pull up. I'm the same guy. Yeah. That's America. Totally. And that, like you say, everyone seems to have to, they can't be bothered to treat everyone with the same amount of respect. It seems to always mm -hmm. be the whole Oh, you're of this capacity. You're of this belief. You're of this right order. So I must either fear you, or pretend to respect you, or make an angry face at you just to let you know, without saying exactly. it out loud, that I don't like you. And uh, again, and, and then I can go to church, and it's all right. Or uh, I can be working at this establishment, and it's okay because I'm an important person. So therefore, I can say anything, do anything. So again, I don't know that any of that is going to be solved overnight. It really and works. I forgot to tell you earlier now, you know, I'm married to this lady who's, I mean, I, I'm not going to tell her age, but she's younger than me, not that much younger, but she actually runs seven miles a day, five oh, days awesome. a week. And we're, we're going to the gym here in about 20 minutes. We what go, we go at night, <laughs> you know, because we try to stay COVID safe. You know, I mean, I don't take I any know, I see many of you do it too. It's just easier that way when everything is less occupied there's mm -hmm. less dilemmas in some areas they do like to treat like red tape like uh, i've even had certain areas where people just I, I, there's even apartment complexes where they want me to close down the gyms I'm like why it has a purpose mm -hmm. nothing else here has a purpose Before, you ever notice the people that want you to close the gym down earlier the same people who probably have never been in there you know correct <laughs> yep they definitely got their share of giant bellies and this is not yeah. meant to shame but it is very enlightening how what other people have i can't have and therefore neither can you and yeah there's yeah. that kind of logic too a little backtrack on the well no that, that that's badass that you got a partner like that who again respects their body and everything and with the amount of mental health uh, podcasts and just food and fitness that's enlightening, I'm just glad that many are actually just considering respecting their bodies more and more. Um, going back earlier to uh, just, again, uh, the just nonstop, how in uniform, out of uniform, it's tough to tell, remind people, you know, I'm a civilian just like you who happens to have a badge. Um, uh, I, I've read, I, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. Um, I heard on a great true crime podcast, uh, a few bad apples and, you know, they were chronicling everything from people who were given college funding for, as a result of their families being wrongfully prosecuted during the seventies to just all other sorts of stuff. And they always remark about brave real life officers you know, who helped, again, helped out their communities as well as those who abused the badge. But uh, there was one wild story on how it's very hard for uh, pe partners, like men or women who are married to a cop, to get divorced. And if the relationship happens to be an abusive one, like the person comes home and is drunk and, you know, lets off a few slaps to the face, uh, it can be hard to even get a proper divorce trial because of the blue badge um uh, do you think again just someone may hopefully come uh come out eventually and just say hey you know we got to prosecute everything again based on facts not based on unions right i think well the cops don't prosecute number one the district attorneys do but i think you brought up something that's important um there is uh, domestic violence and policing, uh, significant compared to jobs, a, a lot of it. But divorce is rampant in this job, and it's inherent because of the nature of the job. You may have a, a female that's a police officer and her husband isn't, 
And her husband may not understand that she's going to share things with these guys she works with that he ain't going to, she's not going to tell him. Some yeah, guys yeah. can't take that. Um, also, a lot of times it's cops marry cops. That very, very rarely works out. It just oh, doesn't yeah. because it's egos fighting. But then to anybody coming into this job or you've got one or two years under your belt and you think you got it figured out, the question I get asked the most from people is, I'm thinking about being a cop, should I? I never tell them yes, I never tell them no. Right. I say, you Just know, think whether about it's it carefully. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Iraq, Satan, whatever it is you pray to or you believe it is greater than you, go in a quiet place with that entity and you ask that greater being, is this meant for you? Because you are not just going to see things that you'll never be able to unsee or hear things you'll never be able to unhear. And citizens think they connect with us because they go, well, I saw a movie or I saw the document. Yeah, you saw it and you heard it. But you but know what you, you didn't live do? It? Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, you know what you didn't do? You didn't smell it. Mm -hmm. You can't get that smell of that dead body out. Well, you can go six or seven months. You're on vacation somewhere and somebody cooks something that smells like that car accident where the person burned up and that comes right back in your head. Ugh. So it's not just about what you see on the job and hear on the job. It's about what you smell on the job. It's about what you feel on the job. You don't get to feel the documentary. You can't smell the documentary. You just see it and you listen to it. You get to turn away at the scary part. We can't. That's where we have to be focused because everybody else turned away. We have to be able to say what happened at the scary part. That's where yeah. the hero part of this job comes in. That's so true. And I, I've seen people even treat cops kind of like they would like veterans of war. They're like, so how many people you arrest or kill? Again, they want to go into just the action side. It's like, what, uh, first off, why would you want to ever ask anyone that? You know? <laughs> and so again, uh, just going back to all your earlier points, it seems like empathy is just gone. Everyone just likes to kind of fuel this testosterone kind of, you know. Sure, and by and large, that question you said, we get asked that a lot. How many I people bet. have you shot? Have you ever, and believe it or not, most cops don't take offense to that, or police officers, they don't take offense to it because from movies and docu-series, and I watched the first 48, so therefore I'm a homicide expert. We, we understand you're coming at us conditioned to buy what media has shown you about us. Okay. And then we also recognize that we're not the most forthcoming, transparent, and conversational profession out there. So we understand that curiosity you have much more than you understand that your question could be offensive to us. You see what I mean? And that right. part, that's where the community should hit the brakes and say, wow, he or she didn't talk to me. They're an asshole. No. If I shot 10 people, what business is it of yours? Right. In this day and age, why would I even want to tell you that? What are you going to do with it? Run out and put it on social media? Right. So, I mean, we're people, and I know the vast majority of good officers, and I know a lot, and y'all will go, well, we don't ever see the good stuff. I'll tell you why. They don't hit the Facebook button when they do it. They're not <laughs> telling the department they did it. They're not doing it for the department or the city. Social They're getting media. off work and going back by that house with a bag of groceries. Yeah. And they don't uh, want to put this person's condition on social media. So there are a lot. I think there are more good cops out there than bad cops. But I think doing good things is not good enough. If you're not calling out the bad officers in your department, you're really not helping. You're part of the problem. Yeah. That's right. And unfortunately, everyone likes to, again, take shortcuts and I get it. We all have people at work who are trying to get fired and it can be more trouble than it's worth. And that's where it's like, yeah. okay, I can move to a different apartment. I can get them kicked out eventually, or I can just have a total sit down meeting. It doesn't help that everyone still kind of goes by the whole HR thing. Well, let's, let's all just get along here. Let's have a big private chat. And it's just so annoying when it's just like, unless the, anything is going to change, you know, if this is just, oh, you all get along, it's like, no, that's, <laughs> that doesn't work. Exactly. Someone has to go. And, you know, I've worked for temp agencies and 
I, I got a good sense of how, again, everyone goes about different jobs a different way. And I would see people who would put jobs on the fly. It wasn't a matter of it wasn't a good job or it didn't pay enough. It was a matter of I'm done. It's like, oh my God, you're so inconsiderate how so many other people work for this job. You had all the skills and you just blew it away. It was like, uh, I had just wiping off marker on a chalkboard or something, something like that. You know, exactly. Just, just nothing to them. And so I think this is it. Uh, a lot of people are just, they want to just ask redundant questions or come home and vent, but they don't want to get anything done. And so it does get very alarming when you just see it at a rapid rate and you're like, okay, yeah, you know, it's the same thing as advice. Right. Like you say, it's like, if you actually want me to weigh in on this, I will. Otherwise, I'm going to save my breath, you know? <laughs> I got to get ready to hit that gym. Okay. Well, this has been a delight. Oh, well, it's everywhere. Behind the Blue Curtain is every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 Central. Uh, we have a, It's a call-in show, 646-716-4621. It's right behind me there. Woo! And, and they can call in. We got a great panel of, of co-hosts that, that join us and and we we go straight in much like we do here so this was an honor to do and can't wait to get this episode uploaded to others so <laughs> yes sir thank you anytime you be safe okay right godspeed to you godspeed bye-bye thank you for the enlightenment we'll return after these messages JURS Podcast is proud to promote AutoCorrect, an independent film company with experienced industry professionals who can serve all your film industry needs. They include self-tapes, voice actor recordings, demo reel editing, script revisions, headshots, and much more. They're actor correct at your request. Book them on Instagram. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure All, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of. They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali and the odd guest host Cure What Ails Ya. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, uh, necrophilia. Uh, uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema Psyops is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in it. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get out of it. unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Sion. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. 
This is what you want. This is what you get. Greetings, friends. My name is Dean Legero, and I'm the host of the 3324 Podcast. I invite you to join me and my lifelong friend, Eric Kuber, to come with us as we discuss the music and movies that shaped our life. Each week, we'll pick an album or film that we really connect to, and not only give you some great info and trivia, but also discuss, debate, and celebrate what it means to us and the journey it took us on. We also look forward to hearing from you and giving us some of your picks for us to check out and discuss. I think it'll be a really fun experience, so come along with us for the ride. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider and at 3324.buzzsprout.com. Thanks for your time, and welcome to the 3324 family. It's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple of brews, baby. We love good movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot holes a gratuitous movies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steven Izzy. At EILFM.podbean.com. We now continue with our program. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.